For 150 years, the American Public Health Association's dedicated public health officials and organizations have worked diligently to create the world's healthiest nation. APHA is the only organization that combines a broad-based member community with the ability to influence policy and improve the public's health. From the beautiful city of Boston, this is the 2022 APHA Annual Meeting and Expo, and this is APHA TV. Hello and welcome back to episode two of APHA TV. I'm Atria Godfrey, your host for the week as public health professionals convene, learn, network, and engage with their peers. Today we are focused on disease prevention and the APHA's role in that. Straight ahead, we will take a walk through the public health history display as we catch up with APHA's incoming president. We are also sitting down with two public health experts leading the NIH's Community Engagement Alliance. And we pick up our tour across America of organizations and universities paving the way in disease prevention and overall public health. We start off today with our focus on disease prevention at UC San Francisco. UCSF has had a long, impactful history of bringing powerful public health solutions to the streets of San Francisco and Oakland. This year is no different, as the team has implemented a heavily researched program in Healthy Divas. Healthy Divas is an intervention that was developed by and for transgender women of color. And it's really meant to be a peer-led uh, intervention where um, trans women are trained as peer counselors to work one-on-one. -on -one, and it's um, grounded in the principles of gender affirmation and healthcare empowerment. At some point during the intervention, they participate in a group workshop. And in the group workshop, we have uh, either one or two medical providers who have experience and expertise providing gender affirming care as well as HIV um, prevention and treatment. As a trans woman, I take hormones, um, but I also engage in sex work. And so I'm interested in PrEP, but I wanna know like, is PrEP gonna hinder my hormones? Um, and so the doctor is able to like answer those questions in that space. There's something really powerful about being around other folks who are who have a shared experience as you. Disease prevention has certainly taken center stage over the last two years, and APHA's Alliance for Disease Prevention and Response is working to prioritize the lessons learned from the pandemic. Angie McGowan, Senior Director for the Alliance, joins us here in studio this morning to discuss a little bit more. Thanks for your time today. Sure, thanks for having me. So let's talk a little bit about what APHA's Alliance for Disease Prevention and Response is. So the Alliance is a cross-sectoral group we brought together at the start of the pandemic. I'm realizing that it was really important to talk to all different sectors, all different types of organizations um, to figure out how we get through the pandemic. But we really wanted to make sure that this was a long-term effort. And so you notice we don't mention the pandemic in our name. Um, and so we're trying to figure out both how we move past um, some of these things we dealt with over the last couple of years, as well as to make sure that we really get to the resilient, equitable public health system that we need going forward. So after speaking with some of these groups, kind of going through that information gathering phase, what are some of the initiatives that the Alliance has been involved in over the last couple of years? So the first thing we thought was we needed a place for people to come together, share, talk, connect. And so we've had monthly meetings on topics from vaccine equity to um, working with communities to, you know, going back to school to figure out how people are learning from, you know, healthcare, education, um, public health are all important to work together. Um, one thing we heard though is that we really needed to think about how to collaborate and align efforts and that people couldn't find the resources they need. And so with colleagues from the Institute for People, Places and Possibility, um, we've created what we're calling FERN or our Public Health and Equity Resource Navigator. So it's a place where you can find resources looking at different sectors, um, where people, we hope it's a two-way street. Um, we don't want to own the documents. We really want to amplify what's already out there. And so it's an example of how we try to make sure people can connect. Um, and recently, we've really started to finally transition to looking at where we need to go as a public health system, not just as APHA, but as this collective group of 80 organizations or so, um, to think about what we've learned around the pandemic, the recommendations for going forward for a public health system, 
and to come up with a smaller set of things that we together can put forward as good steps um, for how we'll move forward with the public health system, making sure that we really center it on equity and lift up communities and bring in some of those great multi-sectoral collaborations that have happened over the last couple of years. You know, it really seems like with regard to disease prevention, with the pandemic, it seems like we still have a lot of challenges that we face. Do you agree? And if so, what are some of those? I do. I think one of the big things we've seen has just really been the challenges to both public health itself, as well as to a lot of the people that work in the field. Um, we've seen everything from, as everyone knows, public health officials who've been you know, villainized for doing the work they do. Um, we've seen some lack of trust with what we're doing. Over half the states have passed legislation that actually restricts the ability of public health officials or government officials to act as needed um, in something like a pandemic. These laws passed, I think, based on the pandemic, people being upset about not wearing, uh, you know, having to wear a mask or getting vaccinated. Um, but a lot of the implications are really long term for how we would react to other things um, like a flood or other public health emergencies. And so we're really fortunate that we're working with some really great partners, um, Local Solutions Support Center, um, Act for Public Health, which is a group of public health law organizations, American Heart Association and others. Um, to figure out how we can come together and provide resources to states dealing with these challenges. So it sounds like one of the things that we learned from the pandemic is how desperately needed collaboration is exactly. across the board. <laughs> All right, it is a very exciting week here um, at APHA 2022. What are some of the activities that you're looking forward to taking part in? So I'm really excited that a couple of things we just talked about we'll be able to really lift up over the next couple of days. So on Monday, we're gonna have a session um, about these challenges to public health authority. We also, the next day, have something we're excited about, which is really a brainstorming session to think about how we can, um, if people are ready to act, to think about how they can speak up for public health, um, how we can learn how to communicate about it, to do messaging, to think about how you could figure out what the laws are. So we hope it's really interactive and we hope people will join us. Um, and then we'll have a session Tuesday morning on the Alliance, um, just talking about what we do and also telling people about FERN. Um, and finally, we have two booths, so hopefully people will come visit us both um, at the Alliance booth as well as one for Fern in APHA Central. Wonderful. Lots to look forward to. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Financial security is a super determinant of health, impacting everything from access to care to basic needs like food and housing. Kaiser Permanente has partnered with local organizations to expand access to financial coaching to have direct impacts on physical and mental health. We know that financial security is a determinant of health. Some might even say it's a super determinant. As an organization that truly believes in health, we have to be addressing economic opportunity as an integral part of how we look at health overall. So I firmly believe that um, our health is where our wealth is at, right? If, if we make one wrong decision in our finances, we're looking at years of financial hardship. There's a lot of fear around financial instability. I aged out of foster care at 17, and so I was never taught how to manage my credit, what a credit score meant, none of that. The differences I see in Blake now after financial coaching is she looks happier. So I'm able to manage my CPTSD a whole lot better. Uh, I sleep better. Um, I eat better. I'm able to take care of myself. So it, it, it means everything. So much specially curated content to cover and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. You can always find the latest APHA TV episode on the TV monitors throughout the convention center, on the in-house TV channels at several of our partner hotels, on the APHA website, and of course, on our YouTube and Twitter feeds. Rutgers University in New Jersey is building a unified and inclusive powerhouse center for advancing LGBTQ health and visibility. It's been a very busy few years for the School of Public Health. To the Garden State we go.
The Center for Health Identity Behavior and Prevention Studies, or CHIPS, is a biobehavioral research center that focuses on the health of LGBTQ populations, advances the science, advances the science of health care, and also serves as a training ground for the next generation of scholars. The LGBTQ community, one of our biggest challenges is that we're not counted, right? So there's no SOGI data that's collected. So when we go for, apply for funding, for instance, and we say, well, I know that gay men are underserved in, in Middlesex County in New Brunswick. I have no data to support that, it's anecdotal. And so we need centers like CHIPS who can say, we're doing the research, here's the data that you need to support the work that you're doing. In the process of conducting this research, I collaborate with community-based organizations to make sure that like, the findings from that research is implemented in interventions. We've got a lot of different opportunities ahead of us to really build out what this education, community, and research arm can look like together. To provide science-based information through active community engagement to those hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, that is the mission of the NIH's Community Engagement Alliance, or SEAL. And here to talk a little bit more about what that alliance is doing are the directors of the alliance, Dr. Gary Gibbons and Dr. Eliseo perez Stable. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. So let's talk about the origin of SEAL. Why was the creation of this alliance necessary? Well, as everyone remembers, uh, certainly back in sort of March of 2020, uh, we were seeing the impact of probably a once in a century pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was uh, clearly apparent uh, that it was disproportionately affecting certain communities, uh, particularly underserved communities, communities of color. And I still remember uh, uh, the weekend, we got a call from Dr. Francis Collins, the NIH director. I think it was July 4th weekend. Uh, and uh, uh, we weren't talking about barbecues, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, in recognition of that challenge, uh, and as part of the NIH response, uh, there was an appreciation that we, we probably had a gap. Um, we had obviously set up things to understand the science of the virus and clinical right. trials, uh, but uh, we needed something to do for these communities. And uh, he turned to uh, myself and Eliseo, uh, given the history of our institutes in doing community-engaged research, uh, to see what we could do to, to mount an effort. And so how does SEAL tackle that problem? Well, there are a cadre of scientists who have been doing this work for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. It just has been smaller ep efforts, you know, on behavior change, on cardiovascular risk, on cancer screening, things of that type. So we called on them and said, we need you. <laughs> You're up. <laughs> we don't know where we're going to get the money. We don't know how much money we're going to get, and we don't know what we're going to do, but we need you to step up and, and respond to this. We need to do something about this and every single one of them responded. So since you've created SEAL, what have you learned about what are some of the best practices when it comes to disseminating information? Well, I think, uh, uh, as Dr. Perstavos mentioned, I think one of the challenges in that space was that there was a lot of misinformation uh, and um, a lack of awareness of, you know, who's most at risk, why, which communities, uh, and, uh, and intrinsically there, there, there may have been some sense of uh, does this really affect me? Uh, and uh, it, it was important to leverage those long-standing partnerships that uh, Dr. Elisea uh, Persabu mentioned um, in identifying uh, trusted messengers and, and, and partners uh, that were embedded in communities that really could speak to those networks. Might be a uh, faith-based community, um, uh, the local pharmacist, the primary care doc, uh, and really getting to that ground level. There was already a lot of, you know, public services announcements and our good friend, you know, uh, uh, Tony Fauci right. giving yeah. announcements, but, but what we found it was really important to get to people where they are uh, and speak to them in a way that resonates. And so uh, that was something that these experienced community-engaged researchers understood. And do you feel like after having identified those key messengers, those trusted messengers, that some progress has been made on that front? Absolutely, and right. not only going to the local community and have the local person be the, the, the one delivering the message, which is not something that was being done at the beginning when we started, but also how the professional communities in both African-American and Latino and other 
groups really stepped up and created, uh, way, you know, was it the uh, videos and we're writing articles and we're just really out there uh, to say we've got to defend ourselves, we've got to participate in these studies. Uh, and I think that we've seen now that actually the vaccination rates are not different between white Americans, Latino, Latino Americans and African Americans. They're about the same, at least, you know, three dose level that is being used by CDC to define that. All right. Well, Dr. Gibbons, Dr. Fred Stavley, thank you both so much for your time today and congratulations on the Alliance. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Now let's see that community engagement in action. RADx UP at Duke University is working to show just how important community engagement is to successful research. Let's see how these 125 teams are working together to create health equity in underserved populations. Let's remember March 2020 when COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic. For established health disparities researchers, we knew, we knew that COVID-19 would have a disproportionate impact. The goal of the RADx program overall is to develop, produce, and scale testing for COVID-19. And RADx UP specifically is to implement and distribute those tests in other served populations. The future will include, for example, emphasis on building research strategies that include community collaborators and partners long before the specific research proposal or project or crisis. The, the methods that we have implemented are really gonna set the stage for a lot more funding to be able to apply these methods to all health disparities. As we celebrate 150 years of APHA, what better way to see just how far we've come than by taking a look back at where we started. The APHA was first founded in 1872. Dues were only $5 back then. It wasn't until 15 years later that women were first invited to attend meetings. And since then, the APHA has been doing everything from getting involved in sanitation control to increase public health, all the way to controlling communicable diseases all the way back to the early 1900s. And of course, that's still something we are working on today. Joining me now is incoming APHA president, Chris Chanisolkit, with more on where things stand. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Thank you, good morning. Good morning, so let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. As I said, trying to control communicable diseases is something the APHA has been very involved in since 1910, and yet here we are today. Where do things stand? APHA is still there. It's still there for all of us working to promote evidence-based research for science, but also really for action, letting people know that what can they do to end this pandemic, but prevent future pandemics. And a lot of that looks at voting, advocacy, and also policy making. And we recognize that while we're advocating at the national level, there's so much that's happening at the local level, and we're here to support our communities in whatever way we can. Let's turn now and talk a little bit about your upcoming term as president. What are some of the goals and initiatives that you have for this upcoming year? So I have three main goals for this year. I love things in threes. <laughs> I have three kids. APHA is all about for science, for action, for health. So for this year, my first one is to play for health to bring back the social connections, to have people enjoy their life and yes. to, to bring in some physical activity back in. We've been isolated and inside in this pandemic. And then the second is to read for health because there's a lot of misinformation out there, disinformation. We need to improve that in health literacy, but also you can read for enjoyment, right? right? <laughs> and that's part of just sort of- Bring that back. Bringing that back. And then the third, and I think probably one of the most important ones I want to emphasize this year is to vote for health because yes. um, voting for health is so important, but not just at the national level. We need to vote up and down the ballot, local elections matter, and honestly, so much of our public health efforts, as we've seen through this display of 150 years of APHA, started at the local level. And we need to make that part of our norm, that everyone is engaged, is at the town halls, is fighting the good fight, holding elected officials accountable, and then maybe even having lots of public health practitioners run for office. 
And that's something that as APHA president, you will be involved with in the upcoming year, talking one-on-one -on -one with a lot of the folks in the public health workforce. What's something you're looking forward to about that face-to-face uh, -face interaction, finally? Well, just the face-to-face -face interaction, <laughs> I think is something I'm looking Valid. forward to. I am really excited because I've missed it. I think, you know, Zoom has been great and has really transformed how we do our work and our, the connections that we make with folks. But I know today, just from having been here for a moment with the annual conference, how rejuvenated my spirit is from these one-to-one -one connections and how meaningful they are, but how they bolster me throughout the year and carry us throughout the hard work that we have to do in public health. Well, congratulations on your Thank upcoming you. role as president and best of luck. Thank you. We finished up today's tour of institutions at the forefront of the public health research at the University of Washington Center for Anti-Racism and Community Health, where they are working to break down mechanisms of structural racism, especially how it affects public health. Let's see how they are taking a different approach. We are the University of Washington Center for Anti-Racism and Community Health, and we're known as the ARCH Center. And our mission really is to elevate, uplift, and amplify voices from individuals and communities who've been systematically marginalized in public health and healthcare, and really to be able to be in a position as an institution to champion community-driven um, actions for health equity. Discrimination is a health crisis in, in the United States and it always has been and to have discussions around uh, ways to solve these health crises is, is important and the Arts Center is, is instrumental in, in doing that in bringing those discussions into an academic setting and supporting communities of color to, to solve these issues. The Arts Center is unique in that the way I see art is looking at multiple domains, but one specific piece is embedded in the actual name, which is community health, right? And with that, we wrap up day two here at APHA on APHA TV and our focus on disease prevention. There is still much more to come here this week at the 2022 APHA Annual Meeting and Expo, and you can count on us to cover it all. Remember, there are plenty of ways to watch. So much specially curated content to cover and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. You can always find the latest APHA TV episode on the TV monitors throughout the convention center, on the in-house TV channels at several of our partner hotels, on the APHA website, and of course on our YouTube and Twitter feeds. Thanks again for joining us here on this exciting day from Boston. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.